I read how you started your column in terms of Ubergate with the Sens. It was, it was perfect because we've all kind of been there, right? Yeah. We've all had oh, our yeah. moments. I want to ask you about the business relationship between the Sens and the company. Yeah. Where do, where do they go from here? What are you hearing? And is, is this something where the league might have to get slightly involved in some way? You know, I mean, I saw the shot in the tweet last night and what you guys show with the Uber. Like, one of the things I did ask and just doing all the reporting on it was there is a relationship between the two. And, yes, there is. And of all the times, you're right, last night when that came up from Chris Ryan, who covers the Devils, you couldn't help but do a double take and just say, what a night. Now, you know, one of the things is, is that, you know, in a business relationship, Sometimes you have to let things, you know, move off to the side. There's business and there's what you might feel uh, towards the company. And I think what you're going to see is there's going to be a conversation between the Senators and Uber, whether it's Uber Canada, wherever they have the deal with about that. But just because that thing happened in the cab with one particular driver, I don't think you're necessarily going to cut the business relationship. I I'm just curious to see... I know that the players are trying to see, do they have any legal recourse in terms of this? Um, you know, Arizona's a single-party consent law, so they probably don't have any particular recourse against the driver. But I'm sure, individually, the players are going to look and see, is there anything they can do with Uber to prove damages? And I don't know what their chances or success are, but I do think they're looking into it. What about the damages in the room? I mean, last night was a pretty good result. Mark Stone, who stood in front of the media and answered questions before that game, answered some questions on the ice. What was the feeling like after the game from what you heard in Ottawa? Well, I think the one thing you have to realize, Tim, is that now we know that the team has known about this since I think last Friday. So they were at least in a position uh, you know, Friday or Saturday to start talk. Uh, actually, sorry, excuse me, the players, I think the tweets were made towards the reporters last Friday, and the team was made aware of it on Saturday or Sunday. So the team had a couple of days before it got out to at least discuss this internally. They all knew about it. Um, they had their heart-to-hearts. They had their conversations. So I think they dealt with it uh, before the game and obviously they played pretty well and they killed off a couple of penalties which I thought you know it's unbelievable last night you know by the time Ottawa was blowing them out I was watching more Toronto and Montreal's games because their games were still closer but all of a sudden in my Twitter feed I started seeing people say oh this is what we've been waiting for and I looked at them like what and this is because Ottawa had to kill a penalty and so I mean the voyeuristic nature of it was certainly out there but I think internally they did a lot of this dealing with before the story came out. And then they got hit with the knowledge the story was coming out. I agreed with, you know, Sid, what you said yesterday about the fact that I thought the players should have, the seven players or the six who were still remaining should have been the ones to face everybody first. I don't think other players like Craig Anderson and Mark Stone should have had to deal with that initially. But eventually they came out and they uh, they'd said, said what they had to say. Um, you know, I, I think if last night was any indication, maybe they have put it behind them internally. You know, we'll see. It was a tough thing to come out. The other angle of this fridge is, is between the Sens and post media. Yep. And I'm thinking about the guys in that room covering that team every day who really yep. had nothing to do with this decision mm -hmm. to post it. Um, I mean, PR... Sens have asked for them to take it down, for those who don't know. And Post Media says they are not doing it. Mm -hmm. Like, where, where does that relationship go? Because PR has been a problem with this. Team. Well, I think that there's definitely going to be... Like, if you look at some of the scrums, and, and I've asked a couple of the reporters who've been in them, not necessarily the Post Media guys, but other guys, you'll see that there's some situations where players are giving one-word answers, like, yup, nope, and that's directed at the Post Media guys. And, you know, I've been in, like, I remember a few years ago, uh, one team in the playoffs was angry about something that happened on Hockey Night in Canada. And it was a playoff series where I was the ringside reporter. And I asked for something, and they said no. And I said, okay, is this directed at me? Or did I, I actually didn't know that they were mad at Hockey Night for something that morning. And they said, we're just angry. I said, okay, what did I do here? Because I know sometimes I say things and people get mad at them assumed and you figure that out yes. later. Yeah, I assumed it was me. <laughs> and they said, no, we're angry about something that was said in the studio last night. And I go, really? And they go, yeah, and we're not going to be cooperating. And it went for like two games, three days, I think it was. 
And, you know, sometimes that's just part of it. Um, you know, I, I've seen players angry at headlines before. I've had players angry at me before. And sometimes they're mad at the place you work for, and you just have to be professional and do your job. And the one thing I think is that, you know, you have to show up. And I talked about this in my, my blog, and I talked this last night on primetime. If you look at the story, the specific story with the video, there's no reporter's byline there. It's by staff reporter. Yeah. And as a reporter, that to me is very interesting because it said none of the reporters wanted their names on it. But you still have to show up, and you still have to get the dagger stared at you, and you have to respect the players and the way they react. You just have to be professional and do your job. And I think if, you know, in most cases, like there have been some cases with me where guys have never forgiven me, and there have been some cases where I've never forgiven other people. And you have to accept that that is the way some people are going to react. But I generally think if you just do your job and you're professional, most of it goes away. Uh, we'll move on from this by talking about one of the other games that you were watching. That was the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, I don't often listen. The Rangers are playing better, but I don't often hear the words four, un four unanswered goals against Carey Price, who at the end of the game said, I didn't make the saves at the end. I mm -hmm. thought he looked a little slow. I thought he looked a little older. And I wonder for the guy that I've been calling the best goalie on planet Earth for a few years now, including the start of this year, if Montreal fans shouldn't be worried about some of the numbers that they're seeing from Carey Price. Well, I think you're always concerned. I think the right now the way the team is playing has really helped the situation. You know, Niemi's given him some good games. Um, you know, uh, you know, a lot of those games you're showing there, games 101 to 200, was last year when, when things weren't very good. I, I think the team is better this year. I think generally Price has been pretty good this season. I don't necessarily... Like last night was a rough night. I'll be curious, do they come back with them or do they go somewhere else in the future? Do they give Niemi a bit more run of games? Um, I generally think he's been trending in the right way, but, I, you know, I mean, you have to see... Is there more than this? That was certainly a goal where, you know, you looked at it and you said, when you look at it from that angle, it certainly doesn't look great. No. Uh, it doesn't look great at all. Um, but I don't know. I, I just don't get up too upset at one-game samples. I'd like to see a lot more. And generally, I think he's been trending in the right direction. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of Habs uniforms last night that didn't look great on that goal. And he no, doesn't have, he doesn't have the greatest it. defense in the world either. I recognize no, that. No, they, they made Pionk look fantastic. There's yeah. no question about that. Um, 23 days and counting, Fridge, till William Nylander Day. <laughs> the right. the I was like, what's he talking about? I am about? now, okay. we're down, I'm counting the days. It's now 23 is days. Is that an official or, or that, uh, Do we have to go to work that day? Like, is it a stat holiday? <laughs> or what? You're on air at 8 a.m. in the <laughs> yeah. morning. That day. Oh, no. <laughs> Sportsnet's uh, William Nylander coverage all day. So oh, no. Don't this, give anyone any ideas. No, that's fine. <laughs> just gave him an idea. A... So, for the four of you who don't know, December 1st, the Leafs uh, have to either sign him or he doesn't play for the rest of the season, or they can trade him, and he'll play for someone else for the rest of the season. The latest on this story, Elliot, is what? Uh, it's just not really going anywhere right now. Like, there's, you know, I, again, like, uh, things could change any second, but they're, they're not going anywhere right now. I, I don't hear much. I think it's sitting and waiting. Um, you know, you know I, I think that there are, t like, put it this way. I think there are teams that have called Toronto and said, you know, here's a list of players you know, pick from them or, uh, you know, I think teams have called Toronto and said, when you're ready, we're in. I mean, you know, I, I think they, but, and I think uh, what I would guess is that Toronto is slowly making a list of teams that they potentially like what they could get and say, all right, if we decide to do this, are you willing to do that? Uh, I believe that's happening. But, you know, aside from contract talks and stuff, I'm, I'm not hearing much of anything. It's, it's really in Toronto's court now. It's, it's really Kyle Dubas's decision. You know, if he doesn't want to move, and I don't think he does to where necessarily Nylander wants to be, then, you know, when does he want to go out and start talking to other teams? That's kind of where we are. Uh, there is one wild card in all this, and that is now that Kyle Dubas knows if he does it during this show in the next 45 minutes, uh, we will see a Ronaldo-like celebration from Sid Sixero, which means he will reveal his six-pack. Ratings, ratings go through Sorry, the roof. His one-pack. Ratings go through the roof.
You know, the thing that worries me about that is that if somebody actually tells Dubas this, he might be the guy who actually tries to make the deal. <laughs> He's that dude? He is that dude? He might be. Okay. Yeah, he uh, thinks I like a little that. differently. I like Sarah's that. getting all excited. I like that. Maybe. I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> uh, Flames looking for a fifth straight win tonight. They have points in six straight after that 9-1 loss. I did watch Saturday headlines. That had me a little bit concerned that there was a little uh, – being and moaning about ice time perhaps yeah. in Calgary. I, I just, it seems weird that after what could be the bounce back point of the season, a terrible 9 1 drubbing, they play really well after that. Is there a little turmoil in Calgary or is it just the natural? Uh, kind of progression of a team trying to find their way. Well, I think it's I think it's a more from column B, but there is definitely a little bit of column A, and uh, you know that was Nick's story, and, mm -hmm. and credit to him on it. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's happened there is that they have a guy in James Neal who I think really wanted to stay in Vegas and really hoped to be in Vegas, and I think it was a big shock to him that they didn't keep him. And it's taken him a bit of time to get used to. And I think it's, you know, James Neal, when he's on the ice, you notice him. If he's, he's either scoring or he's driving someone bananas. And we haven't seen enough of that. And I think part of that is him getting used to the fact that he's not there anymore. And, you know, he has to shake that off. I mean, you know, he wants to play on the top line. But right now you're not breaking up Monaghan, Goudreau, and Lindholm. That's going really oh. well. And, you know, Backlund in that checking line, they've been together for a while. So I think he's not as high in the lineup as he'd like to be. And I'm sure he's a little upset, but I think he also has to kind of shake off the fact he's not in Vegas and, and be James Neal again. As for Bennett, you know, I think the worst of that happened earlier in the year. He was only playing seven or eight minutes the first couple of games. Um, and I think he's carving out a role there, too. He's not necessarily going to be, you know, have the numbers of a guy who was taken fourth overall. But that's a guy who can be a really effective a greasy player in the NHL and he's starting to show it and uh, I think in the long run winning cures everything Calgary hadn't done a lot of winning but I think in James Neal in particular's case he just has to get in the right mindset and everything's going to work out fine. Uh, finally before we let you go your reaction to Milan Lucic being fined $10,000 uh, for roughing Matthew Joseph. Uh, he, you know what were you going to suspend him for? Yeah. Roughing? Yeah I mean. Stalking? You know, I mean, there was, Optics. I didn't think there was anything there that was no. worth a suspension. So why they look at it then, Fridge? Like, well, I'm, you know, I think the one thing about the NHL is, look, you, if, if the guy gets hurt, it's everywhere, right? Correct. Correct. Like, you know, people brought this up and reminded them of, of, like, Bertuzzi. That's not Bertuzzi, but when that happened, the story was everywhere for the wrong reasons. So I'm sure they said to him, you know, Milan, you're lucky this isn't worse. And we're lucky this isn't worse. It's probably what it was. Yeah, but they're lucky every time there's a fight. Ah, I'm just so frustrated by this one because I don't know where the accountability is, Fridge. Well, accountability for, for, oh, for like, Joseph. You know, like, I, like, I, like, I understand that. Yeah. Like, people are upset. Like, he was standing up for his teammate. I yeah. get that. You know, the thing is, for better or for worse, the sport has changed. Yeah. Like, we don't have, we, and I'm talking about we as a society, we don't have the... We don't have the stomach for injuries anymore. It's cha everything has changed, and that stuff that was that we all watched 10 to 15 years ago. The new generation of fan, maybe it's the concussion lawsuit. I don't know what it is, but that's changed. Yeah, there isn't the stomach for injuries anymore.